I thought it was time to beef up the music for my Battle Chat podcasts. So here, just in time for episode 20 of Battle Chat, you can listen to the new intro outro music, which is called Indomitable Spirit. I hope you like it. to Battle Chat number 20. Can you believe it? And um, I've been a busy boy lately. Uh, some of you may have noticed the announcement that, yes, I finished writing Wargaming Campaigns. And it's in the hands of the publisher and my beta readers. And I'm quite excited, really. Um, after five years of slaving away at the damn thing, and it's about 200,000 words, which... Essentially, folks, it means that the new book is going to be the same size as the old book. The the Wargaming Compendium got noticed by a lot of people for its heft of over two kilos uh, at 520 pages. And it looks as if Wargaming Campaigns is going to be basically exactly the same. Uh, in fact, my my publishers are making noises at me. It better not be any bigger than the Wargaming Compendium, Henry. It's like, oh, okay, then. It, it probably could be if I stuffed, stuffed in even more maps and stuff. So I'm going to do my best to keep it to 520 pages. Um, also, of course, thinking of the poor postal workers who have to deliver it, you know. So, Folks, it's it's all out there, and uh, my beta readers have got it as well, and I've already got my first bits of feedback back. Um, my The forward from uh, retired Brigadier Charles Grant um, is absolutely amazing. I mean, I blush even thinking about it. It's um, he's He was a bit bowled over by it, which is wonderful. And my first beta readers come back as well. And the response is overwhelmingly positive. So fingers crossed, folks, it's on course. So what that means is I'm now, I'm literally now, and I have been today, just before um, recording this interview, I've been working on the design and layout already of the book. Because for it to stand a chance of getting into the shops in time for Christmas, I need to finish that design and layout by ooh, end of June, early July, so that it then goes off to the printers who then, they're in India, and they do their thing. And then, of course, it just sits on a container on a giant ship chugging its way back halfway around the world so hopefully fingers crossed it'll be in in the shops in time for christmas so i'm quite excited about that as you can probably tell now moving on i have a guest today that some of you will i know particularly those of you who are interested in kind of role play games that kind of stuff is a name you would have heard also because i recommended a site a while ago called the cartographers guild uh, where a host of people who are superb cartographers of all of all kinds gather together and share their work and ideas um and i spotted this person uh, online, I think tweeting, just with some absolutely gobsmacking, amazing maps. I thought, oh, I must follow them. And I did on Twitter and turns up on Facebook as well. I was like, oh, this is interesting. And, and in multiple guises as well, this person has all kinds of interests, which is great because it means that we can yak about almost anything today. Um, and... Uh, our actual contact started because it was about two or three weeks ago. I noticed that she had done a map that I just, from the air, I recognised this 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 profile of a Vauban style fortress, and it's like, oh my god, you know, this is me at home. You know, all all you guys out there know that I'm just a bit of a nut when it comes to Vauban fortresses. So I got in touch with her and I said, oh, oh, you might be interested in knowing that, you know, love what you're doing there. It's amazing. You might be interested in knowing. That. I actually wrote a series of articles about Vauban fortresses a while ago, and she said, oh gosh, really? You're going to send it through what? And it ended up that I became a patron of hers because she's starting her own patron 
Patreon gig, and she became a patron of mine, which is just fantastically groovy. So let me introduce to you, without further ado, the amazing Alyssa Faden. Hello, Alyssa. How are you? Henry, after that introduction, I, I, I don't know, I think I'm blushing all the way over here, my <laughs> friend. Thank you so much. Hi to everyone. Uh, this is uh, also, folks, this is my, so far, at least, longest distance link up because Alyssa is actually way over in uh, Portland, Oregon. Is that right? Portland, Oregon. Originally from Chester, Cheshire. And now in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, because it doesn't sound like you've got a West Coast American accent. <laughs> <laughs> true, true story. Um, if I go home to England, everyone thinks I'm American. And oh, here yeah. in America, obviously, everyone thinks I'm English. So apparently I'm now kind of just floating somewhere in the middle of the middle pond right Atlanta, now. Yeah, I belong yeah. nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the thing is, you've, you've got that slight lilt that Americans have in their voice, you know, but. Right. You're still recognizing me. You're a Brit. I can I can tell you're a Brit, <laughs> which actually was kind of a relief, actually, because, you know, I thought I, I wondered what it was going to be like. But, hey, we understand each other perfectly well. No translation difficulties today. I, I, I guarantee. So I guarantee to everyone right now, as the longer this interview goes on, this discussion the more English I will sound. <laughs> I guarantee. By the end, I, I, I will be like throwing out a little bloody this and brilliant that. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Not too much for me to bleep, I hope. Anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So, now, I mean, there's, there, as I say, there's going to be some people out there who it, it happens all the time uh, who probably don't know you from Adam. So, go on, introduce yourself and explain to people, you know, uh, obviously you've already said where you come from, but, you know, how did you end up in the States? And and most importantly, of course, what's your kind of gaming background? Because I know that you're a gamer, you're a modeler, you're a miniatures painter, as well as an amazing cartographer. So where did these interests arise, Alyssa? Okay, no, brilliant question. So back in England, like back in the 80s, um, I mean, I got into Dungeons & Dragons, um, but I got into Dungeons & Dragons actually through wargaming. Um, that's like my true blood right there. And I got into wargaming because I was the geek nerd, chess nerd, you know, at school, uh, carry, but without the psychic powers. Um, And I hung out with guys at wargames. And, you know, they actually did Napoleonic wargaming, which I think is a beautiful period. The uniforms, the colors, the vibrancy. And I ended up painting um, some units. And that's what sucked me in. Uh, Like, you know, converting some airfix miniatures into oh, like Polish yes. Usars, right, right. Um, and then I would hang out with these guys and there's this attic space where they're set up and there's like thousands of miniatures on the on the floor. And I would just hang out with them for summers at a time. And I really enjoyed it. And that got me into a wargaming club. And the wargaming club, you know, we're, we're, it was a particularly dry um, uh, World War II game. I always remember it. And uh, I always remember it was like one and a half hours per turn it was one of those <laughs> games you know yeah, 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 yeah. like back in the day and i always remember on the far corner of this war gaming club um there was this table this little tiny table tucked away in a corner and uh, someone jumped up at one point uh, with more energy than you ever see around a war gaming table mm. and it was like you killed my wraith with a plus one dagger <laughs> <laughs> they were playing Dungeons and Dragons. Right. I looked across and I was like, what are they doing? Yeah. And it was kind of new at the time in Chester. Um, I went off and bought the uh, the blue box and the red box, took them to school, tried to get some people to play with me. Um, and it took off, you know, and suddenly there's a couple of groups playing at school. That's where my passion started, wargaming and role playing right there. Yeah. Um, I got older. Um, and I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I got older. I moved to the United States. I moved to the United States just because I've always had this passion for Starsky and Hutch, Kojak, you know, <laughs> Quincy. To me, I grew up, we all grew up on this, right? There's so much American shows that get brought over to England. I grew up on those. Remember the old soap show? Oh, uh, I watched these. Like, I was, they, they were crack to me. Um, so when I got a little bit older, um, getting close to like 30 years of age, I was like, I'm going to I'm going to move to the States. So I did. It had this magical alert to me. And I, I mean, I, I stayed in Boston for a while. I went to Louisiana for about six years, oh, wow. did the whole culture shock thing there. 
And then finally found myself in Portland, Oregon, which has honestly a lot of the England to it. It's very green. It's very luscious. It's very beautiful. And maybe maybe that pulled me in my soul, you know. <laughs> um, but in in this journey, in this journey of life, um, I, I, you know, so here, I know we're going to talk about this later, but, you know, I, I avoided social media like the plague. I didn't trust it. OK, I'm not on Facebook. Don't trust it. Not on Twitch. Don't understand it. You know, I'm, I'm that type of person. And it was about 10 years ago, something like that, where I thought, OK, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to open an account. Let's do it. And I didn't really know what to do with it. But over time, over time, a couple of key things happened for me. One is um, I decided consciously that I was going I wanted to share something a little bit more cerebral mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of people taking photos of their dinner for the evening. And that's cool. If you do that, I'm not going to complain yeah. uh, or taking a photo of their cat. I love cats. I have too. Um, but I wanted to contribute to something a little bit more to combat the, the rising negativity and anger that is out there. I was and I made a conscious decision. I'm going to post something more fun, mm -hmm. something to get the brain juices going a little bit. And I started to tap into my core interests and my core interests are wargaming, miniature painting and history, particularly military history. Yeah. Well, the more I did that, the more of a freight train it became. And honestly, Henry and everyone listening right now, it's, it's become everything I am online really has like nothing to do with my influence anymore. It's like everyone took it. And everyone said, you should do more of this. You should do more painting, share more of your war game, share more of this. And one, the way this happened is way back years ago, years and years and years ago, I, I was in a role playing group because that's an interest of mine. Yeah. And someone shared a map of theirs. Yeah. And bear in mind, I've been role playing since the eighties. I have quite a few maps that I drew for myself. Right. Never shared them yeah. with anyone yeah. up until this point. But there is a guy on Facebook, he shares his map, it's a pretty good map. I was thought, you know what, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'll share my map. And I shared one of my cities. And it blew everyone away. That was probably one of my little life crossroads right there. Yeah. It, it, it like everyone was like, Oh my god, did you draw this? Mm. And I mean I'm sitting there kind of like, you know, looking over my shoulder, what what me? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. And they were like, Do you have any more? And I, I mean, I had dozens. So I was like sharing all of these city maps and people were falling out of their seats and people started to say, would you draw one for me? And well, that became now I'm actually drawing professionally cartography for, yeah. you know, publishing companies like Kobold Press, uh, uh, Frog God Games, even Monty Cook. I've drawn maps for him. Um, and I never would have thought about that i mean even mm. i've met steve jackson i've hung out with steve jackson you know right, yeah. so that whole thing just took off and as that took off um my my presence became a little bit more known to people and so my wargaming passion became a little bit you know uh, uh, more public so yeah. to speak and before you know it uh, there's a local wargaming convention here once a year it's at the end of may memorial day weekend it's called Amphalad. um and I went there a couple of times. Love it. They're my people. I love wargaming. Yeah. And, you know, within a couple of years, they're like, do you want to be the director? Could you help us run wow. this? <laughs> so so and I, I honestly really largely put that down to my social media presence, too. You know, it's yeah. suddenly, well, oh, yeah, sure. I love wargaming. I love the community. Let's do this. So now I have the wargaming going on. I have the mapping going on. Mm. And in amongst all of this, um, I've got like catchapillum.com where I write my little, uh, it's almost satire. It, it's so uh, taking a step backwards for a moment. I love military history. Yeah, I I've think spotted that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think military history is often told in a very dry and boring way. Yeah. Uh, no offense to the professors out there at all. Yeah. Um, because honestly, they're tapping into the what actually happened, the analysis of people and events. And that's important. And we need to keep yeah. hold of that. Um, but I realized that I could actually get a lot of more casual people interested in history. 
by almost uh, adding humor to it. Yeah. So I, I did a catch. I actually started just writing these little short excerpts of on this day in history. Yeah, and that was my that. cerebral content. Right. Yeah. And people loved them. It was just these little sound bites, but these sound bites grew and grew and grew until in the end, it now takes me a few days to write one. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it's it's purely an attempt to get people to look at something like the Battle of Lissa, for example, which maybe they've never heard of before. Yeah. Yeah. Get educated, understand a little bit about what happened, but understand the people, the personalities, the, the events and how as human beings, we really haven't changed. Yeah, we, we've always been like a silly race. You know, I was just going to say that there's an interesting tie in there because, oh, God, it's years ago. Now. I first launched my Battle Games website back in 1998, battlegames.co.uk. And one of the first things I did on that website, because it's like back in the days where there was almost no audience, you know, lots of people were still saying, what's the Internet? Right. <laughs> and I was thinking, right, right. exactly. So I thought, well, I got, what co- what kind of content should I put on the site? So I just came up with this idea of listing every single war there's ever been. Oh, beautiful. Know, in recorded history beautiful. from like 3000 BC through to at that time, let's say the year 2000, something like that. And oh my God, it was it was a really interesting exercise. I mean, you can go see it on my battlegames.co.uk website. There's a there's a, a tab at the top, you know, war in history. And it starts out, you know, in, oh yes, from like 3000 BC to 1000 BC, there's like, you know, the couple of dozen things. And then 1000 BC to, you know, 0 8 or 1 AD or something. Oh, there's a few more. And if every era, every century, you know, up to when the 20th century is nice, oh my God, there is just hundreds of conflicts. And I, I stopped it there because, you know, since the year 2000, it's just, you know, even more insane. So I, I, I completely understand. It's, it's a fascinating thing, um, alerting people to the fact that, yeah, as the human race can't always be classified as friendly. <laughs> No, you know, no. if there's aliens out there in outer space <laughs> looking down, you know, and we're also, you know, they're bound to land in Nevada, aren't they? Because they always do. But uh, the the fact of the matter is, they're probably going to think twice about wanting to come here at all, right? Uh, but yes, your idea with your the the, the Pelham site fascinating for a couple of reasons because first of all it reveals your interest in military history. Specifically, of course, it re- reveals your interest in Roman history. So I, I need you to tell me, first of all, did you ever study history formally or is this just a passion that's grown out of your own reading and interest? So formally, no. Um, and so the reason for this is I'm actually going to go back to my history class at school. Yeah. Was bloody awful. <laughs> OK. Yeah. And, and, and I mean that from someone who actually enjoys history. Yeah. But our history teacher um, had us studying the American Indians, the history of the British Canal System, and oddly, flint napping. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I remember to this day, I had to write a paper on flint napping, and I'm drawing different shapes of flint. Uh, To this day, I'm not quite sure like what that has to do with history. Um, Is that a Cheshire speciality or something? I I guess it must be. You know, back then they didn't have like these, like, you know, uh, these plans, I guess, for class. So our teacher, who was also a geology teacher, apparently it was just an interest of his and that's what he was going to teach. And there you go. So I left school really being a little bit ignorant of history, but you can't do war gaming and you can't do like role playing games, tabletop without developing uh, an awareness of history arms armor names yeah, weapons yeah. well what are the different purposes of all of these pole arms yeah, and yeah. if you've got a couple of brain cells firing you're intrigued you know so i definitely moved out of school because of my hobbies being very intrigued in this but the roman thing came from a i mean i am from chester right and chester course, complete yeah. roman walls the half amphitheater etc um took that for granted until I came here to the United States, where they have less history, <laughs> yeah. just less, certainly less than a town that is 2,000 years old. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to post cerebral things, and I realized I actually really wanted to start sharing a little bit about my roots, Chester, the Romans, and I realized 
I actually really like the Romans. I mean, I think they're sexy. I love the armor. I love uh, like just their evolution of design. Um, I, 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 I started to play to the fact that they, you know, they were very expansionist and they stole a lot of things from all the cultures and they were influenced by the design of the Spaniards and this and that and the other. I acknowledge all of that, but I play to that, you know. Um, but here's the thing. This is where it got away from me. I became known as Roman girl because I'm posting Roman pictures. Yeah. And it was an innocuous thing. It was almost a mistake years and years and years ago. Yeah. And then, Henry, I would have people approach me, like they would PM me and say, hey, Alyssa, you like the Romans. Can you tell me about the Roman tiles as part of the architecture? And I'd be sitting there going, I don't know. <laughs> I, I suppose I'll get a book and I'll learn up. Well, yeah. enough years went by. I ended up reading so many books, so many materials. I have a library just on the Romans, very similar to the one that's behind you right there. Um, that I actually did actually start to learn something about the Romans, but it was almost forced upon me. It's like, hey, Alyssa, you're yeah. Roman girl, so you know all of this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm sitting here thinking, I better know about it now because people <laughs> expect this from me. Yeah. And now when you do Enfilad and the wargaming events, you know, when I run a game, it has to be a Roman game. <laughs> so I, I have to know my stuff. I have to know my battles. I have to know my uh, the arms and armor of the period. I have to know the history around this. So it was it was accidental. That's the truth. It was purely accidental. Fantastic. So the the thing is, this interest in the Romans, uh, this has developed then since you. I mean, I don't know. Do you still play historical war games at all, Alyssa? Yeah, I only play historical war games. Oh, um, now that's interesting. So, yeah. you're, so you're playing ancient games and that kind of thing? Yes, yes. Ah, right. I, I, won't, I won't do, um, a, 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 no offence to anyone where this is a passion and interest of theirs, as long as you are gaming and having fun, I just want to hug you right on. Um, but for me, I am only interested in historical games. I don't do Warhammer or anything like that. Uh, I, can, ah. I can go past a Warhammer table or any of those ilk type games and go, that looks cool. Excellent. But I really, I really start to get excited if I'm looking at a Napoleonic setup, an English Civil War setup or something Pike and Shot. Um, and if someone's got Ancients on the table, uh, I'm shouldering someone out of the way because I want to play. That's fantastic. Because I think this is the thing that that makes one, you know, one of the many things that makes you really interesting at this is that um, I think a lot of people, when they see your maps and cartography, of course, a lot of them are kind of fantasy type mm -hmm. settings and what have you. And, so, and, and therefore, I think that people and also people can't see this. We should have videoed this. You're wearing an old school T-shirt. Choose your weapon, it says, with a series of, you know, polyhedral dice across it now that's really interesting because in in war gaming you know i'm known as kind of an archetypal old school war gamer as we would say over here because i've got a love of kind of the the the, the miniatures and rule sets and books and stuff that were produced in the 1960s and 70s and what have you and uh interesting that i don't actually play that many of that type of games but i've just sort of become like you've become the librarian of the romans i've become the librarian of old school war gaming okay that's cool and, and i don't i'm going to turn my thing you can see these shelves over here these are all kind of books Alyssa, that were produced back in the kind of 1960s oh, beautiful. And 70s and stuff, right uh, and i i think i've pretty much exhausted whatever was printed back then but anyway they are turning back this way um but in that T-shirt refers to old school as seen by, of course, people like Dungeons and Dragons gamers and that kind of stuff with all those polyhedral dice. And it's a throwback, as you say, to the kind of 1970s, 80s in that genre of gaming, isn't it? So it's, that's interesting. But your Ancients gaming, then you better tell us about this because there's a lot of the people listening to this podcast are mad about Ancients, right? And I, and I a few weeks ago, interviewed Richard Lockwood, who's one of the, the leading guys in the Society of Ancients. You know, there's a okay. big organisation which worldwide, not just over here. And so you better tell us what kind kind of uh, ancients gaming you're doing what rule sets you're using what miniatures are you using come on tell us some more <laughs> all right so 
Uh, for starters, I've got more miniatures than my house can possibly accommodate right now. Um, I can see uh, some uh, empty floor space behind you. That's... <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I'm taking that as permission. <laughs> those, those cupboards behind me have 15 millimeter miniatures in them. Um, wow. I've got, I, I'll tell you about them in a second. I've got a 28 millimeter. Um, I love 28s. I yeah. love 28s. That that's old school to me. You know, I mean, I know that they were probably closer to 25s back in the day, but that slightly larger scale are so beautiful on the table. Oh, cool. um, I have so I have a stack of those mainly. So mainly, um, I have 15 millimeter Romans, and I'm going to call it barbarians. You know, whether yeah. they be Celts or Gauls, that sort of part of the uh, the world. And I had enough to run um, Watling Street um, on like a, a one foot 20 scale. Wow. There were a lot of miniatures on the table. Um, I, I like big games um, and I cannot lie. Um, no, I mean, I like, I, like, I like games that turn heads. My terrain, the setup, I, I, don't, I, I want it to be like almost museum diorama in appearance. Okay. I, I, I don't care if anyone rolls the dice or not. Let's just stare at the miniatures and stare at this battle. You know, that's kind of where <laughs> I'm at. So I have a lot of 15s. Um, and then I actually um, have a whole bunch of 28s. And I have um, early Imperial Romans and some Dacians. And again, a whole bunch of actually Germanics because I did yeah. Tudorburg. Um, oh, right. last year and I did that and there was like 4,000 miniatures or something like that on the oh, table wow. for it. it was a 16 foot table um, oh, that I was doing it I hope you're going to send us some pictures I'll send you some pictures of it I've got quite a few so, um, it was a wonderful table uh, it, it was, and I actually I got the Osprey book on Tudorburg that they released fairly recently yeah. where they took a slightly different take on it um, like almost, I want to say almost less pure forest and more this is where the path that the, the column would have marched through and yeah. so on and i kind of put that down onto table side so yeah there was a lot of forest but there were these different paths and things for the players to, as the romans to be able to sort of try and get to the other side you know gotcha, yeah. so many 28s mainly the romans sort of period mainly the early imperial i do have 15 millimeter um greek successor states you know oh, wow. um so i have a bunch of them because i love like the phalanxes just oh, on the, the table formations. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, what is there not to love about that type of unit? You know, it's just yeah. so attractive. Um, and let me see. And yeah, that's probably, that's probably my ancient period. So ancient as in mostly Romans, but some Greeks. Okay. Those are the, the, your, those are your, your interest is in the classical ancients, the, the classic, yeah. classical yeah. Ancients, which is yeah. fantastic. Early Imperial Romans, that appeals to me. I don't have any yet, is what I have to say there. Uh, but Greeks and Macedonians and stuff, oh, that's always, you know, floated my boat. That's music to my ears. Uh, and particularly against the Achaemenid Persians, whether early or late, you know, that's, I just love that kind of thing. And, and oddly, oddly, I actually lose interest right about 200 AD. And like, you know, yeah. as you start to get towards the later Romans, and I know a lot of people love the late Roman period, mm. I kind of look at it, I've got to be honest with you, just cards on table, I go, eh! Because they start to look like everyone else. Yeah, they start yeah. to do what everyone else is doing. And what I love about the early Imperials, uh, or even the Republic period, is um, they were different. Yeah. They were doing things differently, you know, and there's, there was a certain dynamic on the table because of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it sounds to me, because you're someone who loves a pretty table, <clears throat> there's a show that's in a couple of weeks' time here called Partisan, which is just okay. outside Nottingham, Newark, just, out, not, just outside Nottingham, which is renowned for its beautiful looking games. And I'm going to be reporting from that show. I might do some oh, live nice. tweeting and stuff. Um, kind of look back through my, I did a couple of Flickr albums, because um, you're a patron, oh, you're going to get access to all sorts of stuff, Alyssa. But I did a couple of Flickr albums from last year's show and i think you'll see that's the kind of show i think you would enjoy some really pretty big tables with beautifully painted miniatures uh the ancients gaming thing is great um so what rule sets are you using when you're playing your games are you great playing? question great question so i actually keep things pretty simple with my ancients um and i'll, I'll tell you i've got about three rule sets that i use for those um and then when it starts to get more towards your Napoleonics and your black powder sort of period, I've, I've probably got dozens and dozens and dozens of books I, I, I use. So with the ancients, um, 
I actually use Hail Caesar yeah. quite a bit. Uh, I'd like this. Uh, now, uh, let me take a step backwards for a moment. You were talking about like that old school war gamer. Uh, yeah. I grew up on Donald Featherstone. Yay! <laughs> I, I adore Donald Featherstone. Yeah. Like I, I never met the gentleman. Yeah. Um, I know people who did. There yeah. you go. See, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. I grew up on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, and by the way, he was so influential on my life, you know, because there was no internet back then. You, if you wanted rules, you went to the local library. Yeah. You went through their six books that they had in this hobby section, and you'd pull out one, right? And they were invariably all Donald Featherstone. And I, that that that's my roots. That's my roots right there. Fantastic to hear this, Alyssa. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> So I, one thing I think with hindsight that I can say is Donald Featherstone rules were always pretty simple yeah. at the end of the day. You yeah. know, you get the likes of, you know, Age of Eagles or whatever it's called, you know, Edition 2. Um, and it plays like Dungeons and Dragons First Edition, where it's like there's a different die for every single like check. And sometimes high is good and sometimes low is good. Well, that's great. I like crunchy. But at the end of the day... I want to get a game in around four to eight hours. I, while I love mega games that are going to last for 36 hours, I I can't do that anymore. Yeah. So I've got, to, I've got to hit about a four-hour window, especially if I'm running at a convention. So yeah, conventions yeah. have tended to influence a lot of what I'm going to play with. Mm. I love the Hail Caesar rules. They're simple. They're accessible. Um, you can tweak them a little bit. Um, you can house rule them. Yeah. And still, they can be fast-paced. Now, if you get to a game of the size of my Tudorberg one that I did last year, though, I think Hail Caesar hits a brick wall real fast. It's like the minute you start to get towards six players, they start to slow down, like mm. exponentially, mm. in my humble opinion. Mm. I then shifted to something called DBE, which is basically DBA, yeah. but it's like well, uh, 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 it's extravagalis or something. I think the E stands <laughs> for. Um, but... They are very, like, roll a couple of D6s. That's how many pips of actions you've got. Yeah. Move whatever you want. Now, from a general perspective, that's really nice and simple and fast. Mm. Um, so even at a 28 millimeter scale, I use these almost DBA variants. They were simpler um, mm. than DBA, and they were quick moving. You're moving entire stands of troops based upon, like, you know, how many pips you've got. I, I like to introduce, though, like, little event cards. I, I have a custom deck that I built. Okay. And players draw from this deck, and it has little random events. And you can hold it in your hand, or you can play it. So it could be re-roll an action die, or move an extra unit, or yeah. light the wicker man. All yeah, roaming yeah. units around it need to take a morale check. You know, yeah. so I introduced and it's really good for complex. So mainly this DBE, so the DBA variants and Hail Caesar, those are my two go to right now. So you're playing kind of uh, this DBA variant, but with uh, with big units for sure. Big show. units. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because yeah, there is the there's so many variants of DBX everything. <laughs> DBM, <laughs> DBA, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's really interesting to hear. That's a, that's a good idea for conventions. I can see, you know, particularly where you have a restricted time window and you know it, there's nothing worse for spectators than to basically come up to a table and nothing's happening right or they want to it's it, you're kind of getting allowing them to participate and they want to participate but again nothing's happening uh, this is one of the great conundrums of conventions of shows isn't it where because because over in the states one of the things that's well known is that over over there you tend to have more participation games because people of course are tra tend to be traveling much greater distances to to get to the shows whereas here uh one of the problems that you know we've discussed discussed on this show in the past is that a lot of there's, there's a lot of shows here uh certainly probably from about march through to october even november there's pretty much one every weekend somewhere and sometimes two and there's an you know unfortunate clash so what that means is people get a bit blasé about it and they'll often just go to a show do a bit of shopping and then by two o'clock they're on their way home again and the organizers and the traders and the people's putting on the games again well where the hell's everyone gone right <laughs> and and so one of the way the problems with that is because in the uk 
we've tended to like pretty tables and pretty troops which is great but people just come along and go oh yeah that's nice and move on right they might stand and chat about oh how did you paint those miniatures or whatever participation games are a lot of people here are now waking up to the fact that if we want to keep people at the show we, you've got to let them play right and you've got to let them play with pretty troops as well you can't say well we'll take along our the b team troops because we don't get don't want to get the paint chipped right <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got to let them play and be inspired by, you know, the terrain that you've built, the, the miniatures that you painted, that kind of stuff. So this is really interesting hearing from you that you just one idea there of, you know, being able to run a big game, but in a short, you know, finite period of time, knowing that people want to kind of move on and do other things. Brilliant. I mean, this is God. I can see we could yak for hours just about that. But... Something else that I've noticed, you know, about your interest in not just military history. Recently, you've done a thing called Windjammer Wednesday oh. uh, on your Facebook, page, where you've been po posting pictures of, of beautiful kind of Age of Sail ships and that kind of stuff. Beautiful. I mean, it's it's in relatively recent period that I've actually become interested in actually gaming kind of Age of Sail stuff. But you've been finding these wonderful images. So tell us about how's that come about, Alyssa? You know, that suddenly, you know, in amongst all your Romans and everything else, suddenly there's these beautiful ships of the line and stuff appearing on your Facebook page. Well, so 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 this is another one of those. Um, I don't have control over my own wall. OK, Um I, and in truth, my my wall is I, I I kind of run my social platform more as a group, an interactive. We're all together, maybe down at the pub, having a drink, hanging out, just having fun. That's my social media presence. Okay, it's not about me. It's about us enjoying something. So, a long time ago, I, I um, you know there seemed to be a pattern to Thursdays just being a rotten day for me. Thursdays were just a bad day. And I ended up calling it Throat Punch Thursday. Uh, and it became a thing. It became a hashtag, right? Throat Punch Thursday. Oh, and I would rumble about something and I'd post a picture of like a flanged mace or, or, or a spiked gauntlet or something. Throat Punch Thursday. Someone's getting a throat punch. Well, you take that Throat Punch oh, Thursday. So... I, it became strong, cold Saturday. I used to post a lot of castle pictures, right? Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Um, well, then people are saying, well, you should do an X Tuesday. You should, uh, it's Tanker Tuesday, by the way, where I, I have to post something about tanks. And I used to post, I do post about these, these wind jammers. Now, I love the Age of Sail, yeah. like, a lot. I'm no expert, but I adore it. And so... I, I, I think one day, one day on a Wednesday, I no, it, it was probably a Thursday or something. I posted this sales ship. It was a beautiful, it might have been the bounty or something like that back in the day. And someone said, you should do a wind jam on Wednesday. And I was like, yeah, I suppose I should. I suppose that's what I should be doing. <laughs> um, so that's what I do. But it's, now it's an expectation. Now I have to, right? I wake yeah, up yeah. on a Wednesday and I go, I need to post something that is wind jammer e, oh, And I, I collate these pictures and things that I found. And sometimes I try to wrap it around a story, you know, maybe a historical reference, you know, talk about, you know, the ship design or something. And occasionally I'll slip in a, a, a dreadnought or something like that and call it wind jammer Wednesday. Uh, but that, that's the honest truth. It became just this thing that I have to do now. Fantastic. I mean, all, this is all, of course, leading to the fact that people listening, you have got to go and follow Alyssa on Facebook uh, and on Twitter and everywhere else she appears and sign up for her Patreon page. You'll find out particularly why in a minute about that. It's, it's just brilliant. It's, it's really interesting that your journey into social media has been quite different from mine for different reasons and stuff. But you've ended up with, you know, a substantial following. I think that's fair to say. Um, and it, I, I kind of get the, impre the impression that you're probably as surprised by it as I am, you know, that, that suddenly you find, oh, my God, like the other day I read I, on Twitter, I've got like 2,100 followers or whatever it is. It's like, wow, that's amazing, really. <laughs> and it's also a strange thing on like all social media and, and, and blogs and forums and stuff, because what you get is a fairly small percentage of those people who are 
active participants in conversations and a huge number of lurkers, right? Who, and it just makes you think, well, why are these people following me, right? It's really nice. Thank you very much indeed. But you don't know, you know, what kind of actual kind of penetration you've got in terms of if you do something, how much support are you going to get? Now, this is, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about Patreon here. It seems an appropriate moment because obviously you're fairly a recent arrival on Patreon. Yes, I have. And, yeah. uh, and congratulations, by the way. And uh, you've got, I, I can't remember, you've got 50 odd patrons so far, or whatever that is. You know, good start. Well done. Because um, um, I'm i quite heavily involved in the self publishing um, kind of uh, arena, as it were. And I have been for a number of years now because part, you know, my other job, as it were, I'm a graphic designer and I also write other stuff and what have you. Um, and I made the break into Patreon, which just over a year year ago now january 2018 with you know the trepidation that everyone has and i was bowled over that i got as much support as i did as quickly as i did and some of the authors i know who've been writing and you know they sell lots of books and stuff and they're really nervous about getting into patreon or they've dipped their toes in patreon and it's just fallen flat on its face and they say to you know they ask me quite often say well how have you managed that henry and the fact of the matter is i already had a tribe if you like a following on social media and because i was a magazine editor you know people knew my name so when i started my patreon gig um people went oh that's the new thing that henry's doing oh let's go and you know support him doing that which is fantastic and of course i'm incredibly grateful whereas of course it, it would be fair to say that someone who just thinks i'll set up a patreon page but they've not done any kind of outreach work prior to that is probably going to be bitterly disappointed and have an unfortunate experience so and what's it been like for you, Alyssa? I mean, how how did you hear about Patreon and, and what made you decide to take that route? Uh, great question. So, um, you know, I've been drawing, uh, I, you know, I've been a professional cartographer for, some, for something like uh, 10 years, maybe slightly less, right? Um, and somewhere in that path, let's say around five, six years ago, um, Patreon comes onto the scene. Mm. And... I since then I started to get people with more and more frequency saying you should be on Patreon you should be on Patreon mm. and at first I didn't even know what it was then I become aware of it then I start to get an understanding of it but you know what it's like I mean there's only so much time and honestly there's only so much focus you can give to Instagram Facebook Twitter <laughs> yeah. Twitch you know <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming right and then when yeah. you start adding email communications from Messenger and Gmail and it's like I can't track this so mm. I kind of ignored it for a while mm. until I I felt I can't ignore this anymore I should have a a, a, a presence there so people who want to support me and I can give them something back to them, yeah. um, they have that opportunity. This becomes one way I can reach out and they can show support. Yeah. Um, so, and that was, honestly, it was probably about a year ago that I made the decision I should do it. And it took me a solid year to actually get off my butt and do it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know, it's a lot of work. It is. No, it is. You know, you mentioned before, um, you know, people doing it and then falling flat um, if you look at any, I want to call it almost any social media, if you're wanting to engage with it, and like even if it's something like YouTube, mm -hmm. I think you need to become knowledgeable. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. what Absolutely. is it? Yeah. How do I get the most out of it? Mm -hmm. How do I present myself on this platform? Mm -hmm. And between us, no different. It is no different. Mm. So I looked at what other people were doing. I tried to. I had to make a decision about what I was going to try and give back mm. to my supporters, mm. um, and what frequency, how I was going to communicate. And honestly, it becomes a little bit of like a brand. My page yeah, yeah. brands me. That's the first impression. Mm. And I think it is very difficult. I mean, you, you mentioned that you're a graphic designer, so you think like this. Um, I am fortunate in that I have had day jobs where i have also had to think like this mm. but at the end of the day i think it is hard for some people even if they're extremely gifted authors to then have to think about themselves as a brand oh absolutely or, 
right? <clears throat> or, or to then think, I need to establish a following in order to take part of that following into this platform over here. It's a different way of thinking. And I think that is the challenge that some people have. Yeah, absolutely. And also, the other thing that I realized fairly early on, probably because I've had a lot of experience of kind of self-publishing anyway of in, you know, doing the magazines, which is a brutal forum, that's for sure, um, is you have to be honest with the people that you take along with you. Uh, you know, and right from the word go, I was clear that, <clears throat> look, guys, this is an experiment. You know, it, it might not work. Now, a year and, and a bit, 18 months coming up on, it's like, OK, touch wood, where's some wood? Uh, I think it's been a successful experiment so far, you know, a modestly ex successful experiment, because obviously, you know, probably you, when you were thinking of doing Patreon, you looked around at who's doing what on Patreon and you see people earning tens of thousands of dollars every month or more, you know, and these people are, you know, they're, they're, they're music artists, they're, they're filmographers, whatever they are. It's like, oh, my God, you know, could I just have the crumbs off their plate, please? <laughs> you know, that would be nice. But the, the other thing... Um, uh, that I realized a long time ago, because I've done a lot of uh, fundraising for charity. You know, there's a charity over here called Combat Stress that treats veterans with PTSD and that kind of stuff. And I've been sort of supporting them for years and raising money for them. And when I first started doing that, I thought what I'd get is maybe a thousand people chipping in a pound each for that. How wrong I was. No, what it is, is you get a hundred people chipping in 10 pounds each or even 50 people chipping in 20 pounds each and that's kind of the way it's been with patreon is that i you know when i set up my patreon page as you've seen now i thought you know well what it says come up with some tiers right you know some different tiers of investment that people can make in you and so i just thought well, it's a military thing, isn't it? So let's have a lance corporal, a sergeant, a lieutenant, and, and all the rest of it, which is great fun, you know. And I fondly imagined that what I was going to get was kind of lots of lance corporals and sergeants and a few lieutenants. No, 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 no. Almost the first people to arrive was a handful of generals and brigadiers and, and the people at the top, you know, which is was obviously wonderful you know because it meant that my my funding got to a higher level more quickly than i thought it was going to but also really made me think about uh you know how it is uh, who are the people who are prepared to be like the patrons of old you know like painters used to have patrons you know in amongst the aristocracy and that kind of thing who are the people who are prepared to invest in you doing what you do and are happy for you to just carry on doing what you're doing you know they don't necessarily even demand and I, well in return for this i demand that you give me this this and this um the, the, a lot of them i mean one of my patrons is a, a good mate nowadays called nick skinner half of the two fat lardies partnership who rules writing partnership lovely bloke and also a business consultant um and it, you know he's a useful guy to know and i had a conversation with him quite recently you know when he's talking about yeah well Often what happens is in this kind of environment, what you get is people investing in you who recognize value when they see it and they value the contribution you're making to the hobby, to, you know, this art form, whatever it happens to be. And often they're not the kind of people who are expecting, you know, well, I want my pound of flesh. You know, if you don't do six things every month, well, I'm off right they're not those kind of people they're people who recognize that you know creativity you can't necessarily just turn on the tap or force it over there in the states and it all comes out sometimes you have to give it time and sometimes you might get six or seven things a month and sometimes you might get two or three things a month but overall you know the the, the body of work that you're building up is what counts now this is where I want to come specifically to you and your maps, Alyssa, because, you know, I, too, have been doing maps of one kind or another since I was a kid. I've just I just loved maps. You know, I, if someone asked me, why do you love maps? Because they're kind of beautiful pictures that also convey information. Right. But also more than that, they trigger your imagination. Right. And uh, whether they're 
real maps, you know, like an ordnance survey map. I've always loved all British ordnance survey maps, right? Or a, an old, an ancient treasure map or something like that. Or, uh, you know, maps of old battles or war zones. These have always just, wow, fired my imagination because immediately, and I talk about this in the book that I've just finished writing, it's like you imagine the people living there. You, 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 it, it comes to life in some way. It's not just a, a, a piece of data. It's a living, breathing kind of organic thing, right? So that's that's kind of what maps mean to me. So tell us, you know, how you came to obviously love maps so much, Alyssa. Well, I think I actually wrote this down once, and I think you just read out every <laughs> word that I wrote, and I mean that. Uh, because, no, you're right. Um, there's there's a beauty about maps where it doesn't matter what type of map you're looking at or of what. Um, and I'm not talking about sort of statistical maps that are showing, you know, the... Um, average age range you know in the yeah, united yeah. states or something because yeah, okay that's cool and everything it's got pretty blobs on it or whatever but i'm talking about the sort of the more sort of genuine maps you you almost spiritually step into it yeah right um and in so doing you're thinking about where you're at what's around you who lives there what is the environment like and it becomes it becomes almost this little journey that you're having visually all within a few seconds mm. and that's that's to me what i love um about maps and what i try to invoke in my maps uh, down to you know let's say if i'm drawing a, a fantasy city um I, I will zoom in on a little crossroads and I will draw a little fountain in the center of the crossroads. And I'm already thinking about the people that are walking around it. I'll draw some little benches next to it. Now there are people sitting there in my head. And I might draw a little balcony on one of the buildings overlooking it. And those little details, now I've added personality. I've injected this little bit of life into that map. Right. And it doesn't matter if it's fantasy. It doesn't matter if I, if I take a real world location um, or I'm inspired by a real world location. I still try to inject that. And that's what I see in maps. And that's what I try to get out of a map and try to what I try to put into one. So you st I mean, you, did you study art at school or anything of that kind? Yes, um, I did. No, I mean, I think we all have art at school, right? And then, you know, in the, well, the, is it the fourth and fifth years or something, you have to pick, like, which classes you're going to do. Yeah. Well, certainly back in the day, that's what I had to do. Yeah, I yeah. picked art. Um, that, now, I will be honest with you. I mean, I considered myself to not be an artist, and I consider myself to this day not to be an artist because I can't draw an apple, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just not very good at traditional. Folks, art. you will find no apples in Alyssa's maps. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> um, I, I, so a true story is so we're talking about like you know it's the fifth year of, of like you know high school. Yeah. And o level. It was a, yeah. Right, right. And there was a guy sat next to me called Peter Hambling. Peter, if you are out there today, love you, man. Um, and he is drawing. And seriously, he is drawing like this Warhol style American footballers. Now, remember, this is in England. Yeah. And like the top panel is traditional. The top right panel is like robotic. The bottom left panel is like abstract. And it blows my mind. I mean, yeah. it is the guy was so gifted. And what I did was I got a big, huge piece of paper and I made it completely wet and I got this paint powder, which spreads out when you put it on wet paper and it like spread out like almost splattered blood. And then I got an ink pot and I yeah. spilt it on Jackson that. Pollock. It, I swear, is still up in that high school to this day. <laughs> I, 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 between us, <clears throat> zero artistic talent, in my humble opinion. And everyone else was like, falling out of their seats over this thing. It was framed. It went up in the school. It was there so long after I had moved on. Fantastic. Um, that, so, yes, I had a – and I also, you know, oddly, you know, I went to college. There was an art class I took. Um, 
when I, I then got a job in the printing industry oh. and they sent me off to Leeds Uni um, to study graphic communications. Oh. So it was always been like this. I never went to study art, but yeah. art kind of followed me, yeah. you know, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but largely, I mean, when it comes to like drawing maps, drawing cities, I'm self-taught. I would look at what other people were doing. I look, I mean, I would look at a map of ancient Rome, a big, huge poster size, or grab books from the library and look at the maps in there. I did a lot of co regular contours and things back in the day. That was my early style yeah. until I developed my own style, yeah. you know? Now, that's really interesting because I am a graphic designer, but I've never received a single day's formal training in graphic design. It was a it, for me. This was a career change. I mean, I can't remember if I told my patrons, so I'll bore them with the story again quickly. I'd actually been working in life insurance, right? I was a life insurance sales manager in South End in Essex, and discovered my boss was a crook and walked out of the job. Right? I was a yuppie, and I walked out of my job. I had a hundred percent mortgage, a fancy car, the, all the loans, the credit cards. And of course, and I might have to bleep this out, I suddenly realized, oh, shit, what have I done? <laughs> right. My my honor had overwhelmed my, you know, common sense, probably. But I just couldn't stand the fact that I discovered this guy was a crook. And so I moved down here to Brighton to be with my girlfriend. And, oh, God, I don't know what to do. I suppose I'm going to end up going for another life insurance job. And she took me out for a meal in a little restaurant just down the road here <clears throat> to console me and I had an interview with this other insurance company oh, I don't really want to do it. and we just got chatting to the couple at the table next to us and it turned out he was a graphic designer who just moved down from London with his girlfriend she worked in theatre administration and he was looking to find work he was a freelancer and a conversation got going because this was like 1991 early 91 and he said to me oh um you know i've just got one of these new apple mac computer things and i said oh yeah what's that he said oh it's amazing he started going on about all the things it could do back then almost nothing but it seemed amazing to me and we had this conversation because one of my hobbies was calligraphy right oh nice and i said to him and i've been doing calligraphy and stuff for years i said to him oh well there's no way your blooming apple mac thing could reproduce what i do with my calligraphy You're right and he said oh yes it could and i said oh no it couldn't and and so we had this stupid argument he said well what are you doing tomorrow morning come round and i'll show you so i went round to his house the next day and he had this gray box in the corn you know and i i did a a, a, a a, 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 an alphabet in Ita just in italic calligraphy you know classic italic calligraphy and back then i mean you might be too young to remember Alyssa, but there were the hand scanners that were like four inches wide that you had to press oh no i had one of those right yeah okay so yeah. you know and he dragged and scanned in these things letter by letter into a piece of software called fontographer that sadly no longer exists shockingly in the space of that afternoon, cutting a long story short, he turned my handwriting into a font, into wow. a typeface. I was blown away, right? And, I mean, it's agony thinking about to how long, how many hours it took to do that with this stupid little hand scan. But I was blown away. And two weeks later, we went into business. Because he hated selling and he realized well, a guy who can sell life insurance can sell anything, right? And I thought, oh, my God, this is great because I can get out of life insurance and turn my what was a hobby into what I did for a living. So that's how I got started. That was in 1991. And we ended up being in business together for like nine years, ended up running one of the biggest agencies in Brighton for a while. Oh, that's fantastic. So, you know, that's that's part of my history. But I've never had a it was, I'm entirely self-taught and whatever he could pass on to me. And funnily enough, he wasn't a trained graphic designer either. He'd been a costume designer originally. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is how we met his wife. So. The, the graphic design thing and uh, how this has kind of manifested itself in all sorts of ways. I, I find this fascinating. You know, your, your, our journeys have not been too dissimilar in that regard. And thinking back then to your early days when you started playing Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. Now, of course, there is a pursuit that is crying out for maps of one kind or another right you know starting with your little kind of 
few room dungeons off a corridor to then something more exotic and interesting and i've i've seen you on youtube discussing this subject about how you love thinking hard about the kind of environments that you want your players to be experiencing you know and that something that i'm always conscious of as well is it's too easy to draw maps and even play war games and think entirely in two dimensions, right? That everything's just kind of on a plane. Like there's that old story. I remember my maths teacher telling me about the ant who's, you know, walking around here and he can't conceive of anything above him because he can only see left and right and straight ahead. And sadly, that's how a lot of gamers play their games, isn't it? Very much two dimensionally. So the three dimensionality is always fascinating and this is something that i really love about your maps is that that three-dimensionality kind of pops out you know all oh right you're just drawing on a 2d surface but man you can sense the lumps and bumps and stuff in your map and then recently this thing where i spotted you doing this map based on luxembourg isn't it um, yes in europe with the vauban fortress and oh my god the steep things going down you know in into the river next to the thing and the trees and man i mean you're just so good at that so tell us you know because i'm sure you know that we've got this in common that that start with say the dungeons and dragons mapping must have really fired your imagination about the possibility of what you could be doing right so back then, I mean, if I go back, like, you know, those decades ago, I never thought that what I was drawing back then would ever be of interest to anyone outside of my role-playing group. Right. Like, at all. Like, at all. Um, and, I mean, I, I put these maps into... Co I, I used to draw ink on paper, you know, because there, yeah. there was no computers when I was first doing this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was only when I got them shipped over to the United States after a while of me being here and I dragged them out again, you know, and I showed them to my husband and he's like, wow, these are like, these are kind of good. <laughs> um, and, you know, I scanned them in just so I've got now I've got a copy of them. And then I shared it on Facebook It's honestly up until that first share on Facebook. I never saw me ever doing this as a, as any wow. form of career or anything. It, 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 truth be told. Um, so I mean, how yes, long ago we, was that then, Alyssa? Uh, about eight years ago. Right. Something like that. So um, quite recent. Around 2010. Yeah, no, very, very. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be drawing maps professionally. And I wouldn't have a Patreon. And I wouldn't be on Twitch. I just wouldn't be doing any of these things. I would still be, like, you know, basically selling life insurance. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I never realised that anyone else had... I never realised... This is going to sound big-headed that I was good at it. Not That's the bottom headed line. At all. Not big headed at all. Um, I, I didn't realize anyone would see value in it, that they would see quality in it. Mm. Um, and, and we're talking about things I drew a long time ago. Mm. Um, so then, you know, when I'm drawing for people now, um, and I draw digitally now, but I still hand draw, that, um, that, uh, that has actually enabled me to be better. Um, because I've now, I basically have a monitor that lies flat it's it's called a Cintiq 24 inch HD touch, oh, and it's right. basically a big huge monitor that you can draw on. Bottom line. So I fire up Photoshop. I've I've now got still got that ink on paper feel, right. um, but I can zoom all the way in, and I can erase my mistakes, which you can't do with ink on paper. Um, and that transformed me. That that transformed what yeah, I do because ink. I basically, I was drawing a map for a publishing company called Cobalt Press. Yeah. They're fairly big over here. They're big in the role-playing industry. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I, I need to up the equipment I'm using because ink on paper and then colouring this thing with, like, watercolours or something, it's just not going to be good enough. Mm. And so when the minute I bought that Wacom, everything took off for me. And that's why I can get the elevations now i mean it's just been honed over the years because I, I now have the tools to be able to do you know shadows underneath my ink or color it in such a way that isn't disrupting the ink work so to speak yeah. you know um so yeah i mean honestly though it, everything i have now is almost like purely an accident i never 30 <laughs> years ago if you and i had met and you would like hey you're gonna be drawing maps professionally i would have no no i just i wouldn't have believed it 
that's an incredible break because I think you know me being able to become a graphic designer was an incredibly lucky break uh, and it sounds like you've had an interesting lucky break to the point where you're as you say you're drawing maps professionally so how did that happen how did it get yeah how did you did you get approached or did you approach other people for the no I got approached so this is one of those things where people would probably be you know almost like unhappy with me because they're probably trying really hard to break into whatever industry they're trying to break into. So I share some maps online. People fall out of their seats about them. Um, I get approached by some uh, smaller publishing, you know, groups. There's actually a lot out there about would I draw maps for them? Yes, I will. No problem. I'm kind of like, wow, people actually want to pay me to draw a map. Um, And then it's just kind of, like the significance of the people that were approaching me kind of just grew and grew. It became a thing where I'm sharing now the maps that I'm drawing for these other people. Mm-hmm. And suddenly before you know it, like um, Monty Cook or representative from Monty Cook, and he's huge in this industry, mm-hmm. approaches me and say, hey, Alyssa, will you draw some maps or scenario that we're doing? And now these, this is almost like as if Donald Featherstone had come to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a name to me and i was like wow wow sure of course i mean i'm falling out of my seat now draw you something um so it it, honestly it grew it just it it kind of organically grew the more i did it the more people saw it and i realized that actually it was something i was good at Mm. so now i make the cartography of Alyssa faden page where i share it it got a lot of traction and i was like you know what i can nurture this i i can do something with this and that's where we're at it's interesting because um, i'm glad you kind of mentioned the, the the technical side of what you do because uh the maps i i still i'll be honest i still love starting with a pencil and a piece of paper that's how my kind of <clears throat> imagination works initially and, and i've described it in the, you know, the book i've just finished writing is that i love just a blank piece of paper and just start doodling with a pencil and usually it's a coastline or something like that or you know a, a scenario map something of that kind and it grows organically and then i'll over the, i'll ink over the, the the pencil outline uh and then take it from there. Now, in the old days, funnily enough, I've got one behind me that I just happened to have st- stumbled across. This I did back in 1980-something. Oh, right, on, yeah. The original piece of paper. We started pencil, ink, and that's watercolours, right, over the top of that. I'm, sh- I'm showing Alyssa the map of Martinstadt that I drew, and there's a bit of copper plate calligraphy going across there. You can tell it's actually got wet, this paper, because it's all crackly, right? It's not even on decent watercolour paper. What was I thinking, <laughs> Alyssa? This is just like cartridge paper. How how mad is that? But you know what? I Part of the fun of dis- rediscovering this is that crankliness, you know, that crackliness, because it's like, oh, it's an ancient map, you know, that it's all oh, you found it at the bottom of the sea in a chest <laughs> or something like that. Uh and so I've still got a love of kind of doing things in the, if you like, the old inverted commas traditional way. But soon as I started doing the magazine and, you know, um, people were do, creating scenarios, you know, as, as part of their articles and that kind of stuff. I realized, wow, I need to really get to grips quick with digital mapping uh, and i was already familiar with photoshop from photo retouching and all that kind of stuff and i've done a bit of kind of photoshop illustration that sort of thing and so like you i suddenly went oh photoshop jolly useful thing right and the number of times i you know if i had a pound for every time someone said to me oh henry what's the software you use to to do your maps right and I think they're thinking that somehow you can just kind of, I want North European terrain map and ta-da, there it is. No, folks, that's not how it works, right? (laughs) I get exactly the same thing. I get it a lot. What software do you use? Yeah. Now, fun enough, for the book, forgive me for mentioning the war game campaigns, but I have actually gone out and done some research and found the mapping software that does exist. And there's about a dozen pieces of software. Some of them are quite good, actually, and some of them really not so much, you know. Uh, Some of them are quite basic. Uh, But if people want the kind of maps that, you know, you and I love doing, right, folks, I've got to tell you, it's hard work, (laughs) right? It's, this is, you should go, now, 
Alyssa, I want to talk about there's this the uh, fairly recent development online, this thing called Twitch, right? Which is kind of a live video streaming channel thing, right? That people yep. can sign up to. And you, man, you're online all the time, Alyssa, and you're spending hours letting people watch you do your maps live, right? Which is which is crazy. How the, on earth did that come about, Alyssa? Oh, and you know, I, I I am really enjoying it too. So literally, I mean, we're recording this um, conversation right now, less than a week into me twitching, and yeah. I'm hooked. I am I am hooked. Um, it came about. Um, it was a little bit like the Patrina in a way where people started to say to me recently, "You should be on Twitch." And you know, at first I was like, "No one wants to watch me map. How?" boring is that wrong um, <laughs> i'm wrong no exactly yeah. uh, but it, my my little light bulb came on because i personally i'm a big pc gamer too i love games right and i started to watch youtubers just playing games oh, and so i'm watching someone just playing a game that i could go home and play myself <laughs> but i'm watching them and i'm enjoying it yeah. well these same people are on twitch so i drift over to twitch and now I'm exposed to that area. Now you do have the superstars, you know, the Dr. Disrespects of the world with 30,000 people watching him at any one time. Oh, my God. And that's, but I realized a long time ago that it doesn't have to be that at all. There's a whole bunch of other people that have got 10 people watching them or 30 people watching them. Mm. But it, it, it's not about the watching. It's not about even what necessarily you're doing, but you're doing it with friends now and when that little light bulb went on because i actually there's a there's a good friend of mine i met him at gary Con this year mm. and um he's called cave geek cave geek art on twitch and i actually went and watched him he actually he does maps but in leather um, he's actually oh, uses wow. heat treatments to get like this um a 3d effect in leather that he paints on the leather and they're really good um well i found myself just sort of sitting there one day he's doing this work He's got a bunch of people in there. We're all just chatting to him. There's some music playing in the background. And I'm like, hold on a minute. I could do this. And he he pushed me. He was like, you could do this. People want to watch you. So I was like, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm going to get the hardware. I'm going to get some extra cameras. I'm going to get some proper cameras. They're not actually that expensive to get a decent camera. I'm going to get a couple of cameras here, get some angles going on. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure Twitch out. I'm going to get my little stream deck. And uh, it's been a learning experience, but mm. I actually, Henry, love doing it. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to sit here drawing a map anyway. Anyway, yeah. Right? I might as well draw it and have you or someone watching me talking to me while I am doing it. I had someone uh, watching the stream the other day say, you should draw an apple orchard in there. I was like, that's good. I'm going to draw an apple orchard. And he was, what about this? And so he's now actually contributing to the map yeah. to the point where I was like, Great, I'm going to name this part of the map after you. You know, so it becomes this interactive yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and I'm hooked on it now. That's, I mean, it's fascinating on so many levels there. I mean, first of all, of course, the technical challenges you're describing of, gosh, if you're going to be live streaming stuff, you need to create your own kind of home studio effectively, don't you? And think right. about, you know, the hardware you're going to need and what angles you're going to need, how people actually, and the, the technical challenge of showing on screen what you're doing on your screen kind of thing you know there's, there's all those that sort of thing that's a really interesting perspective though in, uh, for a number of things because what you said there about uh, on twitch you're doing it with friends effectively uh that's how i now feel about patreon that these people bless you all who are listening they're not just my patrons they're my friends these are the people who are putting their hands in their pocket quite literally saying, Henry, we want to support you doing what you do best right now. Those are kind of, those are amazing friends. How else do you describe them? You know, they're not these distant sort of business people or anything. These are people who, with whom one has a relationship, which is just amazing. Um, and th that's kind of grown and deepened over time. That's one of the experiences certainly I've had with Patreon over the last year or so to the point where, um, with my new book, you know, uh, 
it's because it's a big book and I've, all, all sorts of life stuff happened over the last couple of years that meant that I had a big interruption in writing the book. You know, I had mum died and all sorts of family stuff happened. So there was a gap. And I was really concerned about, you know, because I had to get back to the project after that gap, does it still hold together, you know? And I thought, well, you know, I've heard of other writers using these things called beta readers, which is but that's also kind of like terrifying because that book is your baby, right? You've been writing, I've been writing it for five years. It's like, okay, and my publisher must see it, but other people is a bit early, surely. But I overcame that and I just did a call out to my page and said, look, you know, uh, you know I, I, I want to ask some of you, would you be prepared to be beta readers for me and understand that um, slightly terrifying for me, but would you do it? And so in the last week, I've sent this off to the beta readers. And whilst to a certain extent it's nerve wracking, I also know I can trust these people, right? These are people who give a damn about me and want the book to be as good as it can possibly be. And so are prepared to you know, be honest with, and I want them to be honest with me. I don't want them to just say, Oh, Henry, it's lovely, lovely, lovely. I want them to say, Henry, that chapter shit, mate, you know, <laughs> right. either cut it out or rethink it or whatever. And I, because I have that relationship with them, I don't mind them being kind of brutally honest. Yeah. I'd much rather that these people who are close to me are brutally honest than some member of the public gets hold of the book and then says things like that on Amazon, right? In the reviews. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Right? So it's like, okay, this, and, and it was that process as well has helped me realize these people are close to me. They are my friends. You know, they care, I care about what they think. They care about, you know, how I do. And so the Twitch thing, you know, seeing you doing that, I, I went and watched you for a little bit um a couple of days ago it's like oh my god she's sitting well a couple of things occurred to me there man you're really fast when you're drawing your maps oh my <laughs> god people you need to go and watch Alyssa doing her maps on twitch it's an astonishing thing right i think i'm a bit more kind of labored and a bit anal about stuff god above you are so fast your drawing's amazing Alyssa. absolutely amazing that's the first thing. and the second thing is it you're right it's it's peculiarly engaging because i thought like you was like god if i was going to do something like this surely people would go yeah what henry what, what why would we be interested in that and once i came and watched just a few minutes of you doing it i realized god this could really suck you in because you oh yeah Oh, yeah. Because at the end of the day, I think you're talking about, so you have your friends and supporters. Uh, that alone, they're going to want to hang out with you. Yeah. An opportunity to talk to you, mm. to watch you work. Mm. That's what it's about. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think the world has kind of moved on. But remember, you know, back in the day, and I think maybe to an extent it's still like this a little bit in England, but, you know, you'd get – the local newspaper with the TV section about what's showing and when. And if you wanted to watch Top of the Pops and your bum better be in a seat at seven o'clock on Thursday night, because otherwise it's gone. Poof. Yeah. You're never going to watch it. Right. The world's a different place. Uh, there's it's entertainment on demand now. And there's different types of entertainment. And Twitch is part of that. Yeah, yeah. And if you enjoy someone and what they're doing you can watch that someone and interact with that someone right now. Yeah. Right. And that's, it, it's almost like, I mean, I explained this to my mom and uh, my mom's a big gardener. Right. And I was like, mom, it's a little bit like if you found the equivalent of David Attenborough for, for in the garden and he really knew his stuff and he's walking around the garden and he's talking about plants and their Latin names and how to look after them. I was like, you would watch him and you would enjoy it. It's like you might even donate something to him because he's entertaining you and he's educating you. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, I get it. I was like, that's what I'm doing on Twitch. I'm just drawing my map because I'm going to draw it anyway. I'm going to tell people what I'm doing. But they can hang out with me and they could talk about the map. We could talk about anything. We could just listen to our favorite types of music as I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is where the magic is. If you did this, I guarantee people would watch you. Well, this is, you know, this is, I'll be honest, it's given me a, a number of interesting ideas because... One of the things is, uh, as a as a you know someone on Patreon, you're always constantly trying to think of how do I reward my patrons? You know how what how can I maximise the value they get out of the relationship that they have with me? And one of the things that I've also realising, and 
to be fair to Patreon themselves, they do like a Patreon university thing that you can go and watch their videos and stuff and they do updates and what have you. And one of the things they say is, you know, uh, a, a great way to kind of uh, reinvigorate your Patreon offering is to go back and revisit, you know, what your offering actually is. You know, because obviously 18 months ago, I was just thinking, you know, I had a blank sheet of paper in front of me, literally it's like, well, I don't know. What do I what do I give? lieutenants majors what have you and i think i i i'll be completely honest here and you know i'm sure i'll discuss this with my patrons themselves afterwards i think i was being a bit traditional thinking oh well if someone pays that amount i'll give them this and if someone pays that amount i'll give them that and the trouble is you can end up um back putting yourself in a corner thinking oh my god anyone who's a general general who gives me 50 dollars a month oh my god i better offer to marry them more or less you know <laughs> right someone that generous god and i never imagined that anyone would give me the 50 dollars. i was as i said to you i think i, I imagine it's going to be the one dollars two dollars fifty five dollars maybe a few ten dollars anything above that <clears throat> once in a blue moon and it happened completely the other way around so suddenly i found myself with this backlog of things i'd promised to do for that level of patron that's like that's supposed to be happening over like five years not five weeks right <laughs> now something like twitch of course as you've been describing what a fantastic way to say to certain tiers of sponsor look you know come and join me you know here's a url to join me doing this at this time you know because you you can't physically be in the same place you know it'd be very nice to literally be in portland oregon and shake you by the hand and all the rest of it well i can't really do that but this now with social media of course it becomes possible to say yeah but if you're here at this time and place online we can literally talk and you can see what i'm doing and so forth you know, I you've really opened my eyes, Alyssa. I well, really I, really... Yeah, I know I know that this conversation is not about Twitch, but just to tease you a little bit more. And I'm a noob. I'm one week into this. But once you actually set things up and you've set up your chat and your channel, you can actually then create like these roles in your channel, like VIP roles. You get to define oh, them. Right. And so you can give better and better permissions to certain people. So they are able to request more soundtracks or they're able to post links or they can post more frequently. So you don't, you know, you're not getting flooded, whatever it is, you can give them just more of it. So mm. if you, let's say, had one of your $50 sort of generals coming in, like I have $50 level two, right? They get publishing rights to yeah. the, the maps I do. And I have a $25 level. Those two levels, I'm going to give VIP status to. And they're going to be basically able to do whatever they want in my Twitch channel. Post as much as you want, post links, uh, you know, request as much music as you want. Uh, but the, uh, the, you can even have a little icon next to their name so they don't feel special, you know. <laughs> and so you can you, you can actually reward them then across multiple channels. It's yeah. not just the Patreon. It's their entire interaction with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's interesting because obviously, uh, you know, my patrons listening to this, I'll, I'll pose the question. They can comment, you know, um, underneath the post on the Patreon page. What do you think of this uh, Twitch as an idea? You know, is it would it be something you'd be interested in? I know a lot of you are kind of busy guys, it, but is it something you, you'd consider, com you know, coming along to? Because I would be prepared to do that, you know, if people wanted to show, because it could be doing maps, painting miniatures, making scenery, you know, any number of things. And I know these are all things that you love doing as well. I need to mention, because I've got so many topics on my things to talk to Alyssa about here, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We're still okay for time at the moment, Alyssa? Uh, I, I think so. I think we could do it like another half an hour or so, right? Cool. That's fantastic. Um, because, yeah, I, I've got to mention something else that has popped up. I think it was on your Facebook page or Instagram I saw. Man, you can paint miniatures, Alyssa. You're doing a beautiful kind of uh, Polish winged hussar woman miniature at the moment, aren't you? Oh, my God. It's stunning work, mate. Absolutely stunning work. Now, I can see that, you know, you're a very talented brush woman. Again, I presume self-taught and it's just experience over years. So d tell us a bit more. I mean, do you paint primarily using acrylics? You know? Yeah, acrylic. So, I mean, I, it goes back to like the wargaming role playing days, right? And my early miniatures. No, 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 no. You I know, think that's like, true of all, all of us. All though. black. It's 
like painted with gloss paint. Boom, done. No. Um, so I've come a long way um, over the years. Um, and I, right now, I use, it used to be like, what was it? Airfix. Was it yeah. Airfix? No, Humble. Humble, little tins, yeah. right? Enamel I used to paint. use those. Yeah, and you'd have to like clean them off with like a paint strip or something. It was it was yeah. hard duty stuff. I moved on to acrylics. I um, I tried acrylics at first. I didn't like them, um, and so I step, uh, kept with the whole um, humble stuff. Um, it was over here, and I think the industry has moved on a long way. Yeah, There's a yeah. lot of better paints out there now. Yeah. I found the ones that I really like. I get the results I like, and yeah, I mean, it was years and years and years ago that I actually started. Um, painting again after a, after a layoff I, I i'd like to think that as my nan would say i can push a, a brush around um but it was more recently uh, because a, a i have i'm painting i'm doing a lot of wargaming so i'm painting my wargame miniatures and i start to share them yeah. people start to respond to that um, it was encouraging me to paint and i've been doing this for a few years now then i got really busy with the mapping and the twitch and everything else i don't have a lot of time so I reserved Friday. Friday is my painting day. Oh. Um, and one day, a while ago, one of those accidents on um, social media, I, I like to drink a glass of whiskey when I paint. Oh, right. And so I, I was like, <laughs> Friday night in the Faden and Cole household, that's my husband, yeah. um, whiskey and paint. And I just post this picture of a glass of whiskey and what I'm painting. People went nuts it's like i just created a catchphrase <laughs> whiskey and paint Fantastic. well someone created me a logo it took off that much and i'm talking about really? you know i had 200 likes just because of this whiskey oh and paint and i was God. like so this is a thing this is this yeah. is something so now i have to do it again you know i don't have control over what i do yeah. now i have to do the whiskey and paint well i decided i wanted to actually i want to paint things that i want to enjoy painting mm. right um, which I think is true of everything, but it's like I'm going to start getting into like 54 millimeter things, more show pieces, really putting some right. passion into this. And if I'm taking photographs and showing an audience, they better be bloody good. Yeah. And so it's kind of forced me to elevate my game yeah. and get better and learn. And I find myself now I'm looking at YouTube channels, teaching me things, you know. Mm. So it was it was partly accident, partly I've been doing it a long time, and partly it's been a forced i have to step up mm. and it's you know it's encouraging and thank you so much for your kind words when someone like you turns around and goes oh my god this is great i'm sitting here because i'm a pretty modest person i'm sitting there going it's encouraging it inspires me it gives me energy you know Good. and i went to a convention recently and someone like who sells miniatures he makes and sells miniatures he was like we all knew you were good we didn't know you were that good yeah, and it's yeah, kind yeah. of Fluffs up the feathers a little bit. Of course it, it does. <laughs> yeah. Of course it does. But no, seriously, I mean, I, I think. Um, actually, this has been one of the lovely things about the internet, and I've talked with other people about this, is that you hear a lot of people who aren't in kind of the gaming world and stuff about how awful Twitter is, and it's full of hate and bile and politics and nastiness. And and actually, my experience of Twitter and that the experience of a number of you know, my wargaming colleagues and friends has been, do you know what? Well, maybe we've just been incredibly lucky because actually Twitter's a great place, for example, to post pictures of the miniatures you're painting or the terrain you're building and getting feedback and encouragement. And it doesn't matter if you're just an absolute beginner painter or someone who's like mind blowingly good with their non-metallic metals or whatever you, whatever it is. It's, I found it to be a wonderful place. You know, social media has been great for our hobby. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the latest issue of Wargame Soldiers and Strategy magazine that just plopped onto my doormat this morning, there's um, a great article by Rich Clark, who's the other half of the two fat lardies pairing, you know, with Nick Skinner. Uh, a great article by him about inclusivity in wargaming. And he, one, that's one of the things he mentions is that actually social media has been terrific for inclusivity at least in the historical miniatures gaming hobby and perhaps the, the wider miniatures gaming hobby. I know that board gaming's got some problems. I think that's fair to say. I've seen some horrible exchanges and hateful stuff posted on, on you know, amongst board gamers, which is like 
really seriously it's a game folks steady on but uh, social media has been fantastic for encouraging people and so you know certainly you know i mean instagram's a slightly funny place because you get all kinds of strange people suddenly deciding they want to follow you because you've just posted one thing and then i tend to find the next day they've unfollowed you again which <laughs> It's almost like, oh, they want you to follow them back. And then, oh, yes, we're secretly going to unfollow you for whatever bizarre reason they might have. I don't know. But Twitter's been fantastic. Really, really good for that. Your miniatures painting. You obviously love building terrain as well, though, don't you, Alyssa? Yeah, no, I do. I do. And maybe that's kind of related to the whole mapping thing in a way, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I have this love for you know so chester's got this museum and they would have these dioramas that typically had a roman theme to them and even as a small girl i loved them they were just there's something about this model and the artistry that went into it um and i i try to do some i try to do that you know i i love a good war gaming table i love i just love a good setup but i'm, I'm trying to like do more diorama like work than with my painting right and i'm doing that with the winged hussar um right now you know i want to get a tree behind her. i want this beautiful ground that she's going to be on and i want to create it goes back to the maps a scene yeah that has has some soul it, it, it's like a little snippet of time yeah. that that's what i try to do and that okay if i'm painting like a, a unit of romans it's a unit of romans um but you know i actually created a, a, a command tent for my romans once and I decided to put out in a nice big round base. And there's a little scene of generals, uh, like there's one sort of standing there with his arms crossed. And there's another holding out a head in front of him. And there's some guards. And one of the guards is kind of looking sideways as if he's like, oh, I don't like, like what's going down here. <laughs> and I put a little bunny rabbit to one side of the tents behind a bush. <laughs> and then I've got two dogs around this muddy pond. And I've just, yes, it's a command stand. But it's also telling a story, Absolutely. you know, I, I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah, the storytelling thing. I mean, going back to what, you know, at the top of the show where I was talking about, you know, the love of maps and the way that effectively maps are telling a story. Of course they are, because maps are a snapshot in time apart from anything else. Uh, it's the fascination when you, you look back at maps from like the 1600s, 1700s, whatever, where you see the development of a town starting off as a little hamlet around a crossroad. Right, And right. so on and so forth. And, and things like um, the, one of the YouTube videos, and I'll post a link to the, the videos that I found. You were giving a talk at a convention somewhere telling people about you know obviously uh, giving them information about you know th these are people who wanted to learn how to do maps fantasy maps or whatever and you have got this little scene where it's kind of a coastline and there's sort of a, a castle or something out on a little peninsula and there's a river and a bit of more coastline and you started talking about okay so think about you know how's wh where's the town why is the town going to happen here at all how's it going to grow uh, so there's going to be a quayside here right so the the castle needs goods coming in and out because you've got to feed the garrison of the castle. So then what happens is, of course, a little market's going to start outside the gates of the castle, isn't it? So then, you know, that's going to grow a bit. And then the people who regularly come to the market are probably going to start, well, if we're traveling to this market, so we might as well settle here. So they'll build themselves a little house and then there'll be some more shops. And th these organic growth that happens particularly in you know europe and i remember you saying on the youtube video this is what because americans often come to europe don't they to britain and they, why are the streets all so higgledy piggledy and all over the place it's because towns like york or whatever they've grown organically they don't they've not been town planned and right. it's and it's what's quite interesting now you started doing these maps of vauban fortresses and stuff that's the beginning of proper town planning because people say right the prime consideration in this zone is the military so if we want to get ammunition and cannons and men from this side of the city to that side of the city we want straight roads right so there's going to be these big grand avenues and a big grand place you know big square in the middle so we can assemble all the troops and do parades and that kind of stuff and yet outside the walls you know on the what's called the glasses area you know a good commander would say right no one builds anything 
No right. one, no one right. plants any orchards or anything within 400 yards of the wall, right? Because we need a clear field of fire. But of course, over time, peace breaks out. Oh, okay, all right. And it suddenly it's starting encroaching up to the walls of the fortress, the same as it was, right, in medieval times. And this is what I love about your map of Luxembourg, because there's your wonderful big glasses and everything leading down and right outside the glasses there. Yeah, there's orchards, there's fields. Oh, there's some starts as a little shed, becomes a little cluster of huts, you know. And it's it's just a wonderful storytelling device, isn't it? Really, you know, I you can probably tell this. I get really kind of worked up and thrilled about this stuff, you know. And I think that's what I love about the mapping that you're doing, that you are really conscious of the storytelling behind it. You're really conscious of the environment as a whole. You're not just saying, well, it's a fortress plonk down here, you know, and uh, and that's that and there's nothing around it. You're really aware of the story of how these things actually work in real life. It's not this kind of isolated place. There's people and people don't obey the rules, right? <laughs> I, I think I, I think I'm fortunate in that, you know, I am obviously, you know, European um, and I'm going to throw a broad net out with that yeah. only because we do have that history. Right. And yeah. if there's one thing that school did teach me, it was about Martin Bailey castles. Yeah. And right there, you start to get this little nucleus that has purpose mm. and ev every wall, every bot. Every Bailey yeah. has a purpose. Yeah. Um, and then the town or what grows out from around that, um, that I was exposed to. Uh, and very early on, when I was drawing dungeons for my Dungeons and Dragons games, yeah. very early on, I would start to ask the question, who created this? Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Why is there a corridor just going off into the middle of nowhere? Uh, in nowhere, corridors on the ground would be pretty labour intensive to build. Yeah. So, what was the purpose for this? And the minute you start to ask those questions, whether you're drawing a country, whether you're drawing a town, whether you're drawing, you know, a, a fantasy thing on the ground, it starts to take on a, a plausibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about. I want my maps to feel plausible yeah. and if there's an element about them that aren't plausible i better be able to explain it like the, in fact the, the the luxembourg inspired one that i'm doing right now actually has a section that's clearly a man-made canal yeah. and that's that's what it is and i'm going to make sure that that's what it screams man-made yeah. canal because it's very straight right yeah. Yeah. um and i'll probably have a small little divot where there was the natural river that they've now sort of rebuilt and re sort of shaped um, but yeah, it's that you've got to you've got to think about the 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 story, the people, the, the purpose, yeah. and like how is this here? Why is this here? And yeah. I do that with with every, with every section of my town. I think like I, recently I drew the marketplace. Where would the marketplace be? Well, the marketplace is probably not going to be on the other side of the map, two miles away from yeah, town. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's pull it into town. Let's get it a little closer to where the goods are probably coming in and where people would congregate yeah. and then start to throw down tents and there's a little bit of room to do that. That that I think if you can think that way and draw that way or just well, however you're doing it, you, now your map has life. Absolutely. And now and it takes on it takes that almost indeterminable quality where someone will look at it and they can't even explain why they like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, you know, the word you use, the plausibility thing uh, is critical. There's, <clears throat> there's this thing that I do a lot of and has become popular in recent years, again, uh, called imaginations, right? So you're, 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 it looks like it's a game set in the 18th century or the 19th century, but actually the countries are entire, entirely fictitious. You know, it, it goes back to like the prisoner of Zender and that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm well known over here for doing this sort of thing. Uh, but to me, it's really important that people don't just go, oh, those are just made up countries. They have to feel like they really existed maybe in a, some kind of alternate timeline or something like that. To me, that's absolutely crucial. I mean, I'm a linguist as well, so even naming the towns and coming up with things that really are German or French or Italian or whatever it happens to be, 
you know, and you could throw in a few puns and witticisms there so that someone with a with someone who speaks German will suddenly laugh out loud on the other side of the room because they just got it kind of thing. That's that's nice. But it's the plausibility thing in, in designing maps uh, is is kind of what excites me because there is that sort of the, the storytelling aspect that you've described is is brilliant but, and the story not just the big stories of a, you know how did this country come into being kind of thing you know there's the little stories as well like you know why why did the merchant build their house there why is that orchard there you know and and what effects do you know if there's a heavy rainstorm what effect might that have had in the past and wash some stuff away the geography and geology behind it all you know i love this we could talk for probably another hour or two just about that stuff Elizabeth. but what i'm going to do i'm going to be disciplined because i can see that we're getting up to an hour and 40 and we're kind of getting towards the kind of close of, of this so um let's uh, one of the things i, I did want to bring in because i saw you mention it elsewhere and I just want to spend a few minutes on it, if you're OK with that, which is um, I, I've saw you talk about elsewhere how your you found your self-confidence was boosted by being involved in gaming and m mental health and that kind of stuff has been a, quite a big issue in the gaming community over the last sort of six to 12 months. It's kind of bubbled to the surface. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's really good that people are finding the courage to talk about the difficulties that they've had, you know, facing depression or anxiety or whatever it happens to be. And more importantly, that the community is being supportive of that, you know, and that, that you know, there's an awful lot of grumpy old git guys like me <laughs> who are kind of admitting in our 50s well you know to be honest you know uh, you might think i'm kind of a macho type but actually i over the last couple of years in particular i man i discovered what real depression is right and we need to talk about this because if it's happening to me i bet i'm not alone and i have seen lots of people who have kind of coming out of the woodwork and saying yeah me too when it comes to the depression sort of thing and we do need to talk about this both about what we've experienced in a negative way but also perhaps remarkably how supportive the gaming community can be and mm -hmm. how therapeutic our hobby can be in all kinds of ways um and i'd be interested to hear your story because you because you said something about how becoming a dungeon master way back you found really kind of boosted your self-confidence yeah oh 100 percent, 100 percent. uh like night and day uh so you know i i you know, I, t I tell this story and no one believes me because everyone sees me as a very competent woman now. But the truth is, at my core, and certainly back at school, I was a very shy person. Um, I mean, I laugh and joke and say, you know, I played chess. I was in the computer class. You know, I was a geek and nerd before geeks and nerds were cool, you know. Yeah. Um, and I... You know, in many respects, did not have a pleasurable sort of childhood in, in some respects. And I was the quiet one, but I'm also the quiet one that has the Dungeons and Dragons rules. And I'm the only one that understands them. Mm. And I've, I've got actually the American term is jocks um, wanting to play. <clears throat> Yeah. But I'm not allowed to tell their friends and I can't talk to them at school. <laughs> but they want to be they want to be in the group. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um and I've got like, I've got guys that are like they were the professional football players, yeah. uh, you know they were like you know the the good looking guys at school, yeah. and it's like they wouldn't talk to me at school, but hell, like they want to they're going to be in like this D and D group, yeah. um. Well, but I have to be the one that's running it. I now have to stand at the end of the table, and come up with the story, come up with the characters, come up with the world, a believable world a believable story, a plausible story, and entertain this group of guys. Yeah. And that is, a, 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 it's almost like a, I got a man up, you know, yeah. type of in inverted quotes. That, it almost forced it upon me. I, I had to grow as a person. I had mm. to be, you know, at the end of the table and be used to talking to people, mm. standing, almost like entertain them through oration, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and the more you do that, the uh, the better you get, the more confident that you get. Plus, now I'm actually hanging out with friends, you know. Yeah. And we'd, we'd leave school 
and some of them became very dear friends to me, um, even to this day. You know, and I would go and hang out with them, and we'd just talk about Dungeons and Dragons or God knows what else for hours and hours and hours on an end. So yes, that definitely, uh, it I mean, it, it it forced me to uh, face my insecurity. It forced me to. Um, Get, be more confident as a person, but also to interact with people in a much more confident manner um, and, and to have uh, some self-value to myself, mm. you know. Mm. And that's honestly carried forward. I carried forward into the wargaming and wanting to run a good solid game uh, with energy and vibrancy and command. And, OK, guys, let's go. Roll some dice. Let's get initiative. Let's do this thing. Mm. And recognizing where things are slowing down and saying, OK, pick that up. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's um, go. I'll be honest with you, when I then started moving into the professional field, I still had a lot of those insecurities. But over time, I've left all of that behind. And I can stand up and do stand up in front of a room of 100 people now and talk about anything we want to talk about with supreme confidence. And that is all because of Dungeons and Dragons. Fantastic story. Absolutely brilliant. And I mean, I recognize a lot of that in myself as well, that, you know, people see me as, oh, and they imagine I've always been massively self-confident. Uh, not true. And as you go through life, you go through certain periods where actually your self-confidence can waver. But actually, I found the hobby has always been very therapeutic. The friends I've made through the hobby and just the activities themselves are very therapeutic. And in fact, you know, Combat Stress is a, a charity I support over here. And they're using uh, miniatures painting and model making and that kind of stuff in the therapy classes for veterans because they've now recognized yeah this stuff is actually really really good for people it's really good it gives them a sense of achievement it gives them uh, a shared like you know they're amongst other people doing the same thing you know they build friendships they get compliments you know this is all fantastic stuff little by little by little and as you say 20 years later suddenly you appear to be a much more confident person um and listen mate uh we could carry on for hours we've done an hour and three quarters and then you know you've got other things to do today uh thank you so much for this conversation i think we're gonna have to have you back on right i would love to i would love to you're right um, you know, we really only became aware of each other fairly recently. Yeah. You're a very easy person to talk to, a fascinating person. Thank I would you. love to talk to you and uh, your, your fans again. Brilliant. Well, that's great news. Um, I'm sure the fans, uh, the, the, the patrons have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. I'm just going to wait, but Twitch, the whole Twitch thing, my mind, as I've been sitting here talking to you, it's like, oh, my God, I could try that. Oh, my God, I could try that. Who knows what may come of this conversation, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Alyssa, thanks so much. I'm not sure what the time is over where you are. It's about 20, it's 20 past nine here in the UK now. You're about eight or nine hours behind. So you're thinking it's time for lunch, I imagine. It's getting close to lunch, yes. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for coming on. And uh, before we go, Alyssa, can you give the name of your the best way for people to find you online? Where can they find you online? Yes. So uh, there's the the cartography of Alyssa Faden. Right. If you're going to if you look that up on Facebook, there is only one cartography of Alyssa Faden. Um you can get me there. You can talk to me there. If you have an interest then in sort of finding my Patreon, there's a Patreon link from there. Um, I always post my Twitch uh, there. So that's a good place to start. I have no problem at all being friends with absolutely anyone on Facebook. So if you then want to actually chase me down on my personal page, my personal page is actually nothing to do with my personal life. It's just about other stuff. So you <laughs> could always hang out with me there too. But the cartography of Alyssa Faden is a great way to start. Yeah, yeah. And what was the, the Pelham thing again I got the, with the history oh. bites? catchthispillum.com catchthispillum.com what an absolutely fantastic domain name no one else <laughs> was going to have thought of that were they? brilliant thank you so much Alyssa it's been brilliant talking to you and we'll catch up again soon I hope cheers thank you so much
This podcast was produced by Henry Hyde using GarageBand on the Apple Mac. Copyright Henry Hyde 2019.